You can support this podcast for $3 a month at patreon.com slash copytradersclub. Or find me on eToro, username Gavin McCauley, and add me to a watch list for future content. Thanks for listening. Copy Traders Club, where you can learn how to make better decisions and more money copy trading. I'm Gavin McCauley, my name and username on eToro. My aim as an eToro enthusiast is to demystify this new and uncharted world of copy trading, understand what are the pitfalls and best practices, and how ultimately to succeed as a copy trader. Here we go. Yes, indeed. Welcome to Series 3, Episode 21 of the Copy Traders Club podcast. This is a roundtable episode, and we have three esteemed guests with us this week. Uh, it was due to be Levy, Bjorn, and Vlad, but unfortunately Bjorn Kreenan had to unexpectedly pull out, but he's got a very able replacement in the form of Stephen Budgeon. So, Levy Lavrinyuk, how are you doing? I'm great, man. Thanks for having me. Uh, you're in Europe as we speak? Yes, at the moment I'm in Hungary. Uh, but this just uh, came very recently because the last couple of months I've been to the Dominican Republic. And before that, uh, yeah, other places. Always on the move. Always on the move. And we spoke to Vlad very recently. Vlad, is, has your location changed? Yes, I mean, I'm right now in Romania and I'm a bit of a nomad for now, changing places between my parents' place, my girlfriend's place, uh, her parents' place. And yeah, I'm due to become a bit more stable beginning of August. Fantastic. And as if to underline the international flavor of eToro, uh, Stephen, where are you? Uh, thank you very much for inviting me again. Um, I'm in uh, South Korea at the moment. Fantastic. Well, there we go. That's a great spread. So we're going to talk about three topics this week. Part one, the state of the market, all the latest Fed moves and inflation. Part two, Zim shipping services, because you all own it. Yeah. And part three, one idea that you would implement if you were in charge of eToro. Sounds good. Okay, so part one, state of the market, latest Fed moves, inflation. Up until the last couple of trading sessions, well, actually, I had to, I wrote this planning for recording a couple of days ago, but generally speaking, bullishness was getting even more bullish, everyone pouring back into equities, lots of momentum, although there was a bit of a pullback, and now that again has reversed. So Jerome Powell says he's not done hiking rates yet. Inflation isn't coming down quickly enough. Unemployment's too low for his liking. Uh, that's not bullish for most stocks. So the market is largely ignoring the Fed, saying two more hikes. But the market has been ignoring the Fed for the last six months or more. So nothing new there. So let's have a little chat about the current situation. Generally speaking, Levy, how are you feeling about the current state of the market? Um, I was, I would circle back to a couple of months and I'm sure you guys, actually, you might remember that very interesting comment from, from our very best friend, Jerome Powell, mm -hmm. uh, when it was in the midst of, of high inflation, you know, fighting the inflation and everything. And it was, it really hit me, uh, back then and stayed with me ever since. He basically said that now we understand how little we understand about inflation. And it, the reason it hit me was because, I mean, these guys on the top of the, the federal, so the central bank of the, the world's biggest, strongest economy, I mean, if you expect someone to know or have some sort of idea of how inflation works and how to handle inflation and, you know, everything that goes into that, 
then, then it's him and his crew. And by crew, I mean hundreds of, of, of badass, hardcore economists. So when a guy like him go, comes out with, with a comment like this, for me, at least, uh, just basically put things in place that, that I'm no longer that keen to keep an eye on what he does or what he says, because he himself admitted that, uh, you know, they just <laughs> don't really uh, know what to do with inflation. So fast forward, obviously, uh, I think it was like around six months ago. So fast forward to today, the way I see it, and I keep an eye on what the Fed is doing or what they are saying about the current state of the economy and what they're about to do, it, it's still, I still get this sense and impression that they are just basically reacting or trying to make the step that that basically could please everyone, as in, by everyone I mean also the market and the investors as well as the economy, because sometimes these two are not necessarily uh, you know aligned. And because of that, I have to admit that in the last couple of, of months, I just I just scaled back on how much attention I pay and how much I incorporate the Fed's moves into my decisions. Uh, now, after this, just to just to just to, to wrap this up with with how things stand right now. Yes, bullishness is there. People seem to be jumping back on the bull train, like as you said, ignoring the Fed. But I have I have a, a hunch that because there are some dynamics in the economy that are still in place and will likely stay in place for, for a good while. Let it be supply chain problems, resource, resource supply demand dynamics that that will keep inflationary pressures high. And because of that, the Fed can't really put let its guards down. And despite now, it seems like the market is returning to this upward trajectory. I, I expect that this, this will still be a bumpy road with some, some uh, dips and yeah, just some, some more pain further down the road. Yes, you, you referenced something there that you can kind of feel is that people are just tired of being so responsive to Fed activity. They just... Oh, hum! Like six, or four or five months ago, everyone was waiting on tenter hooks to hear what they're going to do every time, and now people are just over it. Are you over it, Vlad? Whew. I mean, if Levy was a bit disconnected with our friend Jerome, I was maybe too too connected, and it's been a bit life draining for me. <laughs> uh, there are a few points that I like to to address uh, from what Levy said. First of all. I don't think, I mean, I don't believe that part of uh, now we understand how little we understand. I actually think they know way more than they would like us to, uh, than they would like to show. Uh, but there's one aspect that they uh, severely underestimated and not only them, but everybody around. And that's the, uh, the lag with which the monetary policy was actually able to act uh, to, to to have an impact on the on the economy, and that's of course because we've just passed the uh, the COVID era where people amassed amount of vast amounts of savings. They took full advantage of the near zero uh, interest rates. Uh, so the monetary policy didn't really have enough time. Didn't really have enough. Uh, yeah, in, enough time to properly act on on the economy and to bring inflation down. Uh, now you also said that yeah, the spirit animals are uh, th the markets are on upward trend. And to be honest, uh, I've be I've been saying this for quite some time. This doesn't feel like a healthy bull market, but actually feels like a frenzy, like you know the like a bubble forming up. And it's so, so, I mean, it's going to sound very corny coming from me uh, because I was three, four years old when that happened. But this period gets so reminiscent of the dot-com bubble because everybody is just, you know, flying and then they're running to put their money whenever the, the headline is. And also, it's not the full market that is go that's going up. It's not the S&P 500, it's not the Nasdaq 100, but it's actually the S&P 7, the Nasdaq 10. It's only the mega caps that are actually driving the, the market uh, high so much. And on, on a consumer level, that has been extremely, extremely resilient. 
the labor market has been extremely resilient and that gives uh, Fed the argument to continue hiking, to continue being aggressive, whereas other coincident uh, indicators are actually pretty much in line with a recession already. Of course, a recession is not such a, a straightforward idea just as you know, two consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth. That's nonsense. There are a lot more factors that are at play. Uh, and Fed, in theory, has been restrictive enough, but the markets, indeed, they don't really seem to care, and they've just been going up, up, up. As a matter of fact, in the first six months of the year, this has been the best start of a year of for Nasdaq ever. Does this make any sense from an economic point of view? Absolutely not. Yeah, and when I have a little look at your portfolio, I see that you own... The ETF FNGU flat. I'm selling it. Which is, yeah, okay. Because uh, let me see if I can just share the screen here. Can you explain what FNGU is just while I'm doing this? Sure. FNGU is an ETF that is focused on the on the mega caps. So it's mostly uh, Tesla, Meta, Amazon, uh, Google a bit of uh, Microsoft. And these have been the ones that have actually uh, driven the market so, so, uh, so much. Uh, if you can actually zoom out and uh, look at the uh, one year scale of the graph, you can see this exponential growth, which makes absolutely no sense for I mean, I understand that these uh, these stocks have been the, the ones most battered uh, in during 2022, but still, it makes no sense that in one year time frame, this uh, this ETF quadrupled in, in in size. And you're thinking about getting rid of it? Not for now. No, I actually, I mean, I'm no. still confident that uh oh you said you were selling it search. meaning you have a short position on the, on this yeah yeah exactly exactly yeah. and now might be the time when it all comes good it's just it's been pretty painful to hold it for the time that you have so far exactly that's what i'm saying that it's been pretty pretty life draining so far anything life threatening going on with you Stephen, in this current market <laughs> no what what i was going to say is i i'm actually fairly positive on things at the moment. Uh, I have a bit, a bit of a different view on the on the Fed uh, at the moment because previously when inflation was going you know through the roof and the Fed didn't really know what to do with it at first, right? And it was you know there was extremely high inflation. It took them a bit of a while to start to increase those interest rates. And you remember back then they were saying it's transitory and that it will come back down and all of these types of things, right? Which we all know now as being completely untrue. So I don't think they handled things very well at the beginning of that when they started to increase the interest rate cycle. Uh, but actually, I think over the last kind of year or so, I think they have been pretty well planned and they've been pretty upfront with what they're going to do in terms of the interest rate hikes. Uh, I think they have been trying to um, put as much news out as possible through uh, policy makers, speakers, etc. to give uh, people an idea about what's going to happen at the next FOMC meeting uh, in order not to cause any surprises. Um, so they've actually been pretty structured. And one thing we'll know in the markets is the markets hate surprises. So if um, if there's relatively a lack of surprise, then um, then it's quite good for the market. We'll also see, we can also see from the volatility indexes that they are very, very low at the moment, uh, which means that there's there's not so many su surprises in the market. So I think they've done pr pretty well. And I think really what it was, it was a it was a race between, obviously, the Fed's target is to get to 2%. Um, they've made significant inroads on that over the last year or so. Um, and I think it was either going to be they get to their maximum uh, interest rate uh, rises uh, and then they start to cut or something really bad happens in the market. Everything breaks and they're forced to 
uh, cut those interest rate rises. And they haven't been forced to do that so far because the economy has been reasonably robust. So I think we're, we're not extremely far away now from uh, those target rates of the Fed of 2%. Um, and I think we're quite likely, I think, to have maybe one to two more interest rate rises. But then I think that will be it. And I think that it will, um, I think, I don't think they're going to cut the rates straight away. Um, but I think they're going to hold them there for the rest of the year, for example. Uh, but I think we're pretty much close to peak uh, interest rate rises. I think about a year ago, I think I did, um, I did an interview on another channel where I said that I thought that interest rates would get somewhere between four to six percent. Uh, it's quite quite a wide range, but um, I, I still believe that that will be the case. And I think 5.5, 5.75, I, th I think is going could be could be the maximum. So I'm I'm fairly confident um, that they're making major inroads into inflation, employment staying pretty well, housing is uh, quite robust in the US. Um, so I think there's quite a few. Um, glimmers of hope and light at the end of the tunnel in terms of the market. But we also must remember that we're only now 10% away from all-time highs in the S&P. Um, so we are getting a little bit overheated and a, low, a little bit overpriced again, and we could see some small corrections. But to cut a long story short, I think that the, the worst could be behind us. Interesting. I was going to ask, here we are halfway through the year. And just quickly from all of you, has the first half of the year gone anything like you thought it would? And what are your expectations for the second half? So, Stephen, can you answer that and we'll move then around? So the economy is like held up a lot better than I thought it would. Um, if we would have done this um, interview the end of last year or the beginning of this year, I would have said that it was going to be I would expect it to be a bit bumpy for a while, um, but the economy is held up a lot better than I expect it to, expected it to. However, you've always got to note that when you come off the back of a really atrocious year like we had in 2022, you quite often see these rebounding uh, in expectations of stocks uh, and what could happen in the economy because during times of mass fear, then basically everything gets priced in terms of the fear continuing or getting worse. Uh, and it's and it's often not the case. So I think we're kind of seeing a, a rebounding kind of back to kind of more uh, mean stock prices. Um, so I would say I'm mildly surprised that there's been a bounce back. Uh, and I do expect the second half of the year, I think it will be um, I think it will be a little bit up and down. I think it will fl fluctuate. Uh, I don't think it's going to go up much higher from where we are um, right now in the second half of the year. Um, but I'm very bullish uh, moving forward into 2024. How about you, Levy? First half, second half? Uh, for the most part, I totally agree with Stephen. As in, I was also, and this is the right way to put it, mildly surprised that that the market starts moving upwards. Uh, at the beginning of the year, I was expected more like a, a a flat sideways trading because it was so many uncertainties, so many unknowns ahead. It was extremely. I remember Vlad and I and the rest of our bunch had many conversations about how difficult it would be for anyone to try to. To, to make any kind of educated guesses of, of which way we're going to come from here. Again, this was around January this year. Uh, so seeing that the market actually returned to an upward trajectory was, was mildly surprising. Now, going into the second half of the year, uh, again, uh, just, to, just to tie this back to what I said about the overall state of the market, I also expect some, some, some up and ups and downs. Uh, as we like to put it, sometimes it's sort of bull and the bear, it's sort of like a kangaroo. Uh, that it's yeah. jumping up and down in a high volatility. And what I would definitely highlight here uh, to keep an eye on going into the second half of the year is obviously all those uncertainties that existed at the beginning of the year, except the um, the US debt 
shenanigans, you know, the debt ceiling, because that's now been sorted at least temporarily. We still got a, a conflict uh, in Europe. We still got um, a, a major BRICS meeting coming up in, in August. And I think the way how the economy and through it, the stock market could be affected that most people doesn't have this in their radar for the second half of the year is what would be the outcome of what, what things would be announced on that meeting. Because as we all know, some dynamics are shifting, brewing under the surface in the global uh, economy and the macro uh, scene. So because of all these things, I, I expect uh, a relatively flat, I wouldn't dare to, to guess if it will be higher or lower uh, by the end of the year, but a relatively flat uh, channel with huge ups and downs within it. And Vlad? And now here comes the the contrarian one. <laughs> uh, I actually like to circle back to one thing that you said before, Stephen, and uh, that was actually about how the Fed uh, addressed the transitory inflation. And fully agree with you, they've done an awful job back then. And that's mostly because the Fed, uh, of course, they are uh, driven by political incentives as well but they are mainly guided by uh, a very lagging indicator, the PCE. And that makes them, a lot of the times, makes them take uh, decisions with a very, very, very long uh, delay. Uh, now, going forward, as I said, as I mentioned before, in theory, the Fed has already been in a very restrictive territory, uh, in talking in uh, real, re real terms. Uh, right now, we are at above uh, at around 150 basis points uh, real interest rates, which uh, compared to the uh, last decade norm of r roughly 0% real rates uh, is a lot. It's extremely restrictive. And uh, there are already a lot of signs of weakening economy. And I'm talking about, I've just actually stumbled upon a graph yesterday of uh, the uh, four week average of uh, bankruptcies filings. We are now at the same levels of uh, March, 2020 and uh, the uh, January, 2008. We've never had these periods before, and we all know what uh, what followed next. Now, we also need to bear in mind that central banks around the world have been extremely, extremely restrictive. Uh, the UK uh, economy is, is hurting a lot. The mortgage uh, um, market there is under a lot of pressure. Uh, just recently, the Bank of England has uh, allowed banks and has actually incentivized banks to allow uh, consumers to switch to an interest-only payments, just you know, in order to allow them to cope with the increase in, in interest rates. Uh, the credit creation in, in Europe has been uh, has been drying up severely. We are now facing uh, deflation in, in, in Germany. Uh, I've just seen uh, recently a graph that was showing certain industries. I think it was the, the chemical industry who was expecting minus 30% deflation in 2024. Those are signs of severe, severe recessions. So keeping in mind that we are in an extremely intertwined uh, and uh, global market. I'm not as bullish as you guys. And to be honest, I mean, just bear in mind, I'm a net uh, long investor. I'm a long-term investor and I hope I'm wrong. But just in case, I'm hedging my risk. Okay, well, interesting discussion. Yeah, it's been a, it's been a very strange year and uh, who knows what's ahead. What we do know is part two is ahead. And that means we're about to discuss Zim shipping services because you all own it. Do you copy? Do you copy? Do you copy? Do you copy? Copy Traders Club. Copy Traders Club. Do you copy? Do you copy? Do you copy? Do you copy? Copy Traders Club. Copy Traders Club.
Yes, that's one of our little musical breaks there. Do you copy? Uh, I'm sure you recognize Stephen's uh, vocal stylings on that. Uh, <laughs> one, of the, one of the major contributors. Yeah, it's a couple of times in there. <laughs> yeah, more than anyone else. <laughs> Very good. Okay, so part two, Zim Shipping Services. You all own it. Now, I just want to talk about a specific stock for a change, and it's one that's very popular on eToro. You see it a lot. And I noticed it's in all of your portfolios. It's your biggest position, Levy, and it's considerably smaller in the other two. Let me just check. It's Vlad's sixth largest position. And I think it's pretty small all in your portfolio, Stephen, right? Yeah, it's a couple, couple, yes, couple of percent. Pretty small. Okay, so I just want to talk about why you own it and the outlook for it. Uh, I was going to do an introduction to it, but I presume you guys know much more about it than I do. But anyway, just on, on the surface level, it's a shipping company, obviously. Demand for shipping was very high back in 2021 and even early 2022, but not now. So the it's a company that's been on the market for a couple of years only, although they've been around since 1945, I understand. It's one of these companies with a lot of fixed expenses and when you've got declining revenues both in price and volume particularly a drop-off in trans-pacific trade things start to look not so pretty so as of 2023 let me just share this here you can see the graph i hide that As of 2023, they've gone from being very profitable into now operating loss territory. Sorry for the dogs in the background, if you can hear them. So shipping has tended to be cyclical, but the question is, onshoring, the move in the world to onshoring and friendshoring are obviously serious headwinds. Does that mean we're not likely to see a cyclical upswing in this industry? These are all the questions I have. So let's go back to you guys. And why don't we start with Vlad? No, in fact, why don't we start with Levy? Because it's his biggest position. Which Levy, why do you I, own it? Is it, is it because of the massive, is it because of the massive uh, dividend? And we're going to get onto that, obviously, in so, due course. Of course, it, it played a role uh, in me owning this company in such a you know, huge position within my portfolio. Uh, obviously, back in the day when I when I invested in it and I started opening these positions, yes, the, the huge dividend would definitely play the role. Uh, it was very attractive, as, as you know, so was the um, the fact that the company itself uh, that often gets misunderstood. I was reading about Zim here and there uh, during my research. People said it's a young company. You know, they are just uh, a sort of a startup, which is clearly not the case. The company is more than seventy years old. Uh, they just made their I IPO uh, in 2021, so so they know so they are an established player in the global shipping uh, industry. That's, that's that's the bottom line. So um, back in the day, just to give a bit of context, why I decided to to own it was again the, the huge dividend, the the, the overall undervaluation uh, around the stock price was around 40, 50, even 60, and also that at that point, obviously in retrospect, it's super easy to be smart and know what happened with the shipping industry and you know the, the, the shipping rates and everything. But it, I remember clearly that about a year ago, when I was still elbows deep in my research, uh, reading interviews with uh, industry insiders, CFOs, CEOs of, of shipping companies, and not only them, because obviously they are they, they tend to uh, to sugarcoat things, but also other players within the the wider supply chain. Uh, no one really seen or foreseen the the huge drop and the implosion of shipping rates coming. It, it seemed like the supply chain issues are still have a longer uh, time to sort themselves, and that's why it seemed that this this sort of valuation and all the contracts that Zim entered 
uh, on the lease side, at least on the expense side, uh, still made sense because he expected uh, the revenues uh, to, to stay fairly high. But just to zoom out for a second, and the, re the real reason I'm invested in this company, I'm still bullish in the company on the, on the long term, is something that, that, that actually uh, related to what you just said about onshoring. That, that uh, many Western companies, US companies are now looking outside of China to try to, to bring their production back to you know, friendlier countries or closer. Uh, many countries have been thrown in, Mexico, Turkey, India, etc. Uh, the interesting thing that people forget about this, this whole onshoring thing is that, that you cannot onshore the entire uh, supply chain, the entire value chain. This, this whole procedure, especially with products that, that have a very, very complex production. So when we talk about cars or, or anything uh, similar, uh, there are thousands, if not, not you know, even there are thousands of components, all sourced from different countries, and China would still remain within that supply chain, even if the finished product would be sent to the consumer market in the US from another country, let's say Mexico, Mexico and the facilities in Mexico would still outsource some of their production and some of their supply chains all the way back to China, uh, and this is a this is a completely different topic. So I don't want to get lost in it, but just to stick with the, the shipping element, the shipping aspect. So if you look at the the shipping routes in the world right now, everything is drawn along the lines that that finished goods are flowing from east to west, and raw materials components uh, flow from everywhere everywhere else to east. That's why the most most of the, the shipping uh, freight rate indexes are basically these are weighted averages, and most of them are having the trans-Pacific uh, prices you know, overweight in them. The interesting thing is that if if these onshoring efforts become you know more pronounced and they 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 gain traction, then still new shipping routes should need to be open towards those new destinations. Let it be India, let it be Turkey, let it be Mexico, uh, let it be Vietnam. So this means that demand for shipping won't disappear. They just will be reshuffled re and will be you know, replaced to, to other routes. But the number of ships on, on, on the sea will not actually go down, but actually will increase and will, will grow. And the other interesting thing that, that doesn't get mentioned is the flip side of the coin with this whole onshoring is that uh, and that's that's my key reason why I keep an eye on the shipping industry and Zim in particular, because what we don't what doesn't really make it to the news uh, when it comes to supply chains is that if you look around in the world, in countries like uh, many countries in Africa, Nigeria is a good example, or also in Asia, uh, Indonesia, I think even in Malaysia uh, and other places as well, they are uh, investing a lot of money into building new container container ports, new terminals. We're talking about millions and millions of new capacity. Now, obviously, that money that's being poured into these new ports that will be finished in the next three to, to, to 10 years, they're doing this for a reason. As you can see, the pickup in trade activity between the BRICS countries, between countries that wasn't really in the you know, key focus of the global trade so far, again, Brazil, Indonesia, uh, India, all these countries are are really doubling down on their trade capacity, container trade capacity, which for me foreshadows and foretells that that demand for container shipping will not disappear. In fact, it will grow. Again, it will just sort of redrawn uh, within the global trade, and that's this 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 fact or this this presumption in its own is is enough reason for me to to stick to a player like Zim, who already displayed a huge level of of flexibility. When it comes to deploying their ships on the routes that they see them to be the most, you know, the best fit or the most profitable routes. Uh, so yeah, overall I remain remain bullish both for the shipping industry once this down cycle is over and for Zim in particular. Okay, well, is the elephant in the room not the dividend? Uh, Stephen, can you talk a little bit about that dividend? Why, how it could be so huge, and what? Uh, role did that play in uh, your investment thesis? Okay, so the dividend's actually quite simple, um, the way to, to look at it really, is the dividend was cut in the last, uh, after the last quarter uh, earnings. And that is because basically they have a dividend policy where they pay out, I think it's between 30 and 50% of the net profits in, in dividend. 
And obviously the last quarter, um, they struggled financially. So there were obviously wasn't a dividend, but it's not like the dividends being cut forever. Um, they are just sticking with that 30 to 50 percent um, net profit being distributed quarterly in terms of the dividend. So whilst the um, shipping shipping rates are still low and uh, profitability is hard to come by, uh, there probably won't be a dividend for, I would say, probably for the next couple of quarters. Um, we have experienced some nice, huge dividends uh, over the last um, kind of six months or so. Um, I've actually got a bit of a slightly different take on, on Zim shipping. I wasn't in it from um, the glory days when um, shipping prices were extremely high. Uh, I took this on as a turnaround play probably two to three months ago. Um, and I wasn't trying to time the absolute bottom because I realized that there was going to be uh, some struggles ahead in terms of the container shipping prices. Uh, and I've kind of dollar cost averaged into that position. I'm still dollar cost averaging into that position. I don't think we are far off from seeing the, the uh, lows in uh, shipping uh, container rates. And I think that if you listen to the Zim's last annual report and annual meeting, um, they were saying that um, they expect expected a better outlook towards the end of uh, 2023 and going into 2024. So I think as shipping prices naturally do start to climb, um, albeit that might not be immediately, it might take some time. I think that um, Zim, Zim shipping is extremely undervalued as a PE. I think the PE ratio is about one, if I'm correct, Levy. Yeah, um, so it's extremely, uh, it's extremely undervalued stock. Um, and I think if we have seen the worst of the uh, shipping uh, container rates, uh, then I think that it could have a lot of upside. So to me, this trade had... Uh, an asymmetric upside where I could see that I, I'm not expecting it to go to the levels that it did in 2021 and early 2022. Uh, that was a very specific situation because of COVID and supply chain issues. Um, but I, I, I do think this stock still does have a lot of upside, even if it doesn't get, even if, um, shipping rates don't get close to what they were during the pandemic. I still think there's some nice upside. And I, I do think this stock could potentially could potentially double next year. Okay, just uh, looking at your respective portfolios, I see indeed, Stephen, that your position is down a little over 20%, whereas Levy and Vlad are down 75 <laughs> more. Plus. So yeah. <laughs> that suggests you were in in the glory days. You got in in the glory days of the uh, higher shipping uh, costs and also the dividend. Now, Vlad, tell me how much did the, how much was the dividend at its peak, and how much of a role did that play in your decision? Well, uh, I mean, of course, me and Levy, we were in Zim. Uh, during the glory days and even before it reached the the all-time highs uh, we do made quite some some nice profits of it uh, but what I actually so let me circle back the main reason why I added uh, Zim to, to my portfolio I mean main reason was the guy over there <laughs> I'm pointing to Levy he's just a mirrored uh, camera now, he was uh, the main guy that actually uh, advertised it to me, but then he was right because Zim was a cash machine. The The growth was, was exponential in terms of uh, operational profitability. And of course, that attracted me. And when it gets to uh, dividends of, I think it was roughly 20%, maybe even more, Levy, if you can remember, uh, of course, that gets you thinking and it's very attractive. Uh, then it started going down, 
And the main reason why I held on to it was, of course, that dividend and the the idea that it should turn around simply because of how undervalued the, the company is. But the main thing which I didn't take into account was the cyclicality of, of this business. And when you have so many macro headwinds, when you have wars that are actually disrupting uh, supply chains and uh, yeah, consumer uh, sentiment is actually going down so badly, I was uh, lagging behind in my reaction. And th- that's, uh, that's something that I need to, uh, to admit. But at the same time, I'm not willing uh, to sell and get rid of it, uh, primarily because I still think that once the, uh, the cyclicality will kick in, the, exp- the, the growth will be, as Stephen said, asymmetrical again. We should be able to recover uh, pretty much all of that, those losses and along the lines, uh, cash in some more dividends, hopefully. Um, but the main reason why I'm not adding uh, more right now and why I'm not dollar cost averaging to it is simply because I see a lot of macro headwinds. Levy, are you still nibbling away or do you plan to? I w- it was very, uh, the temptation was high, but given the, the sheer size of the por- of the position within the portfolio, I just managed, managed to, to resist that because uh, I think at current levels, I think it is trading around $12, $12 uh, as of yesterday. Uh, it's very tempting because again, I joined the guys when they, when they say that, that on the long term, it seems to be a very asymmetrical risk reward uh, play. Um, it would be good to add some more, but I just, uh, I just resist for now. Okay. And anyway, oh, I... uh, Steven, it looks like you've got something else you'd like to say before we move yes. on. Yes. Yeah, so I'll probably be adding to, adding to the position. Um, cause I think it looks, uh, I think it looks very promising at the moment. Uh, again, I, uh, I'm not expecting that these moves are going to happen mm-hmm. within the next few weeks or even the next couple of months. Uh, but I do think it's very attractive. So I've, I've been slowly, steadily increasing my position as the price, uh, has, has reduced. And I think I will continue to do that, um, but it, it won't be one of the largest positions in my portfolio, uh, but it could it could make its way into the top 10. Actually, let me just rephrase what I just said, because I think now thinking about it again, for me, that it's like $9 a share is the the, the emotional limit. So if it drops below nine, I would probably also consider to add some more and average down uh, because that that would be, as Stephen put it earlier, it's it's an extremely undervalued a company as of today at twelve dollars a share. So if it drops another twenty thirty percent from here, then it's pretty much a no brainer. Yeah, yeah. You're not supposed to use words like emotional limit, surely. <laughs> there are so I many emotions that, weren't supposed to play. Yeah, part, there are so know, many so. things I didn't supposed to do. Yeah, <laughs> but there there is a lot of there's a lot of fear in that market, and when there's a lot of fear, there's again there's a, a lot of opportunity. And um, yeah, this this I think uh, Zim shipping is a good case of that. And all the, you know, there was a really big dividend in there. So I think I think I'm down about twenty percent on that position in terms of uh, the price I actually bought in uh, at. But I because the dividend was so high, um, I, I'm at, I'm I'm actually not that not that far behind at all. Okay, good stuff. Well. Coming up in part three, one idea you would implement if you were in charge of eToro. <laughs> okay, I don't really have any great introduction to this and uh, I have my own thoughts as to what I would do, but I'm always discussing those. I'd like to hear yours. So why don't we start with Vlad on this one? Have you got an ingenious idea that would add to the bottom line of eToro? I'm not so sure about the ingenious part, but one thing which I would actually like to see on eToro at some point would be options trading. And the main reason why I want, uh, I, I would like to see this 
it's because it would incentivize me to actually learn more more about it. I am not uh, afraid to, to admit that I don't know uh, too much about you know options trading, and I also think it's a very complicated topic. So I wouldn't make it as available to everybody because options trading could easily wipe off uh, a lot of portfolios. But I think that uh, people that have actually uh, achieved their uh, CI, CC, CI, CI, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, uh, exam, so uh, or elite plus uh, PIs, they, those people should actually have access uh, to, to these kind of instruments. And of course, that would add a lot of uh, opportunities for the users, uh, but also to eToro's bottom line. Interesting. Would you welcome that, Stephen? Are you much of an options guy? Um, yeah, I, I, I would use it. I would use it from time to time. I'm not a massive options guy, but I do use options sometimes. I, I personally don't think it's a great idea for eToro directly because I think that there's a lot of uh, beginner retail traders uh, on eToro, and I think it would. They, if they did implement it, they would have to put. Uh, together some type of test to make sure that people understood about the options. Otherwise, they're going to get a flood of uh, customer service requests about why they've lost all their money. But at least eToro very quick in uh, dealing with uh, customer service issues. Yes. <laughs> no, but of course, Stephen, and I agree with you. That's what I was saying, that I think it, there should be some test, there should be some some limit to uh, who should be actually have access to, to this type of uh, of instruments? And as you know, for all the retail investors out there who are also copiers, uh, they would actually get access to this through uh, the PIs that they are copying. And this would actually attract. Uh, th this would be an extra incentive to uh, to copy a PI who uh, who has proven that they can deal uh, options and. Uh, of course, it would be a win-win-win if the people who knows how to trade it actually knows how to trade it. Levy, any thoughts on options? Absolutely, yes. I would be down for it. And in fact, Vlad just stole my idea. Oh, <laughs> so I, have to, I was thinking I'll have to wrap up the show. I should I should come up with something on the spot because because the guys, I mean, him and I and the rest of the guys had a little conversation about you know. The, the first two topics was super easy to 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 answer even you know at, at any point in time, uh, but but I really had to put in a lot of thought into what what new feature or what new thing would I introduce to to uh, be added to eToro's arsenal, uh, and yeah I also I put down options because that, that was something that we've been talking about in the past and I would love to um, to use eToro as a platform to to trade options mostly for hedging purposes. So hedging yeah. my, my, my uh, positions through options instead of just playing short positions because uh, because options are a much better fit uh, for that purpose. But now, and everything that the guy said makes perfect sense that you know if, if Etoro ever does something like this, I think uh, some, some sort of measures, safety measures should be put in place that only those accounts and, and, and people are allowed to, to touch those instruments we know what they are doing because they are they are the absent of the financial world if we try to you know draw a parallel with with uh with booze but but i think okay i have no other choice uh, Vlad smiles because i think you know he knows what's coming i have no other choice but fire away my original idea of what 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 feature i could introduce to eToro and, and just a, a humble disclaimer that this will be don't, don't don't take this serious okay so this is just for just half fun half uh, why not so copy trading feature works great because if someone is inexperienced, someone doesn't have the time or anything else to do their own trades, they just find someone who is doing well. And then if everything goes, keep everything, everything keeps going well, then this copier benefits from copying someone's uh, long positions. Now, when you look around on eToro, what I see, and this is not this is something that is, you know, uh, actually put out there uh, point blank, uh, that, that there are many accounts losing money uh, on the long term, right? And uh, basically, I was thinking about something that I would have a re reverse copy feature. That would mean that you can copy someone, but instead of copying their open positions uh, straight, straightforward, like you know, for what they are, instead you would cover the other side of their trade. So basically, be it the broker, be it the house, 
and uh, and if someone opens a long position in, let's say, uh, I don't want to hurt anyone, uh, Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. So, uh, and anything really, you guys get the point. Uh, then, uh, if you if you want to benefit from from the opposite side of the trades of this person because you see that their statistics really doesn't you know uh, that good, then you would, your your copy would automatically open a short position on the same asset. Uh, again, I circle back to what I said in the beginning. That is just, just take this with a, with a pinch of salt and with a smile. Uh, but but I think that would be that would be an interesting uh, way to spice things up on Etoro. Uh, yeah, you mentioned this before. I, I know. Think, I, I think during your one on one with me, that uh, the idea of shorting PIs, like I have names popping into my head of people <laughs> I would consider. Basically, basically yeah, but but with all honesty, I mean, I, I would be a perfect short candidate based on my performance in the last. Twelve months, so I, I'm perfectly okay to take that. Um, but at, it would be like, no, I, I think that that doesn't require any further, exp, you know, explanation and any further twisting. Just it would be an interesting uh, addition to. You could just short. You could just short Kathy Wood instead. Or that, yeah. <laughs> or Jim. Yeah, or Jim Kramer. Reverse. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Uh, presumably, the PI doesn't get paid for the amount of shorters he has. Otherwise, there'd be people going out of their way to see. To I never really. I mean, really, I know it's not a serious suggestion. So no, it's not a serious. Drill but, down but, into it too much. Absolutely, but to your point, I never really unfolded this idea. What would happen after? So, what would be the dynamics and the the inner workings of this kind of feature? But yeah, that's a, that's an interesting uh, angle to look at it. How the amount of shorters of PI would affect the PI's payment. Uh, but again, I think it's best if you stop here before before someone <laughs> takes this too seriously. Actually, just this isn't my point, but just on what Levy was talking about in terms of hedging, um, they could maybe implement some type of copy portfolios or something because they're, they're always talking about trying to reduce the amount of volatility as much as possible uh, and for, for people to hedge. So they could put in place some um, long short portfolios because I, I, apart from the PIs, some PIs portfolios, which are long short, I don't think that they have any other products which um, hedge the market. That's true. So what is your idea, Stephen, in all its glory? Yeah, so um, I don't really have a too dramatic idea because I didn't have too long to uh, think about this. But the main the main thing that I would like to see kind of implemented is I think that there's a too much focus on uh, short-term results and people hopping between whatever's the hottest um, stock or whatever's the hottest PI at the time, depending on what they have in their portfolio and what's doing well at, at a given time. So you see a lot of people rushing towards either that stock or towards that PI in time, so they're doing really well when it could just be the fact that um, the asset classes that they're invested in are, are having the time in the sun, right? And then often people are jumping in and then it starts to dip or starts to correct. Like obviously AI is the hot subject at the moment. So people who invested in AI are doing really well, could correct itself. Uh, and then copiers could be left um, out in the cold. So. What I would like to see is a little bit more focus on kind of longer term. And I'd like to see some metrics around uh, PIs that are put into profile into the profile a bit more, a little bit like you get on the um, overall summary sheet of the uh, PI fact sheet um, where you can see the um, the cumulative uh, profit of, of the PI. You can see... Uh, the risk ratios, you can see all sorts of different, how they've done against the S&P or the NASDAQ or combined mixture of them. I'd like to see that be a lot more accessible um, and for there to be a little bit less focus on marketing whatever's going to get, you know, is going to gather the most interest at that given time because I, I think that's how investors can get left holding the bag. Um, if if they just keep chasing from one hot subject to another hot subject. 
Yeah, it's funny. You know, ever since I started this podcast, it's all about learning lessons and what's the most intelligent way to approach copy trading. And one of the keys is you don't chase recent short term performance. Mm. You know, yet when it comes to the popular investors that are placed before your eyes, it's mostly those who've had good short term performance. So, uh, any other thoughts on that? Uh, how about you, Vlad? Yeah, and I was just gonna say, can I get an amen for that, Stephen? Because I'm fully on board with uh, <laughs> with your points. Uh, yeah, and I think that another. Uh, okay, I'm not. I'm not sure if this is gonna spiral into a full blown discussion. But one thing that I would actually like to to see on Itoro and what actually creates a lot of discrepancies, especially for long term investors that are being copied, is the fact that when you start a copy uh, position the uh the amount is distributed based on the invested uh amounts and not on the actual uh, uh value of the of the position and i know that c- could spiral into a lot of different uh, conversations uh as in i'm confident with losing another five percent from my gains while the uh, the one that copied me might not be confident or with uh might not be fine with losing five percent of the invested amount but yeah, having the option to choose would be would be something nice. Yeah, that's been talked about since ever since I've been paying attention to these things, and uh, yeah. Itoro has intimated. I think it's fair to say that that's on the way. I've heard that yeah. from loads of people, but I think uh, when it comes to certain issues, it takes a long time to turn around the huge ship that is HMS <laughs> Itoro. <laughs> yeah. I, I think the concern around that was that I think the main concern was that people's they thought people's positions could get out of control to so say a particular stock or um, asset class. It starts to do extremely well and it becomes uh, double the size of the original investment, triple the size of the original investment. And then copiers are going to be left with a much larger portion of that stock than the original investor bought. However, I think that um, popular investors should be trusted to manage their portfolio as an overall overarching portfolio. And those maximum limits that they have in terms of the maximum amount you should hold in a particular one stock um, should also count uh, where it is actually today, not just where it was where, when you bought it. And it, it would encourage popular investors to um, be more careful uh, with the positioning of their portfolios. Excellent. Well, gentlemen, we're coming up on the hour. So if I could ask for your closing thoughts as I do a little bit of housekeeping here. Uh, Levy, closing thoughts. I was thinking what what else I could add to to this you know, the, the conversation around the, the, the current state of, of how how the copy trading uh, works and what what would benefit both copiers and PIs. But because the guys did a, an excellent job uh, in in finding the key points, uh, I'm left uh, without anything I could add. And what else? Uh, no. Nothing really comes to mind. Okay. Well, I mean, I didn't tell everyone to prepare closing thoughts. So if you have any, now is your chance for the other two gents. Well, no particular closing thoughts. Uh, just I'm really happy that uh, got invited again. Really happy to, to get a chance to, to speak with you guys again and to meet Stephen. And of course, having some contradictory discussions about uh, the outlook for the markets and having uh, hearing some other ideas uh, is always super nice. Stephen, thanks for filling in the super sub. You did a Solshar esque job. Yeah, go in the last moment, go in the injury time. All <laughs> right. And on that note, gentlemen, I bid you farewell. Thanks for being here. Thanks very much, everyone. <laughs> thanks, guys. Bye. Bye. That's all from me. See you on Discord and Facebook. Until next time we meet at Copy Traders Club, I wish you many happy returns.
Obviously, anything you hear in this podcast is for entertainment only enough financial advice, do your own research, this is just generic chit chat. We don't know your individual circumstances, etc., etc., and so forth.